flash bulbs are popping all over the place. The kids are going crazy. Elvis is just standing there. He hasn't said a word yet. Nobody commanded the stage any better than Elvis Presley. The most exciting, raw, animalistic things I've ever seen. And the girls started screaming. She was out in front of that public again and performing and doing what he does best, and that's sing his song. All these youngsters and people that come down to see him, and no one even knew where his car was going to be. I never will forget when he played the Astrodome, which was the first big concert with 60,000 people. He's the only star I have ever met that looked like, acted like, a special person, a star. But those things slipped away. Interrupting with a bulletin just in from Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis Presley may be dead. An unconfirmed wire service report says the 42-year-old singer was found unconscious in his Graceland mansion in Memphis, rushed to a local hospital where efforts to revive him reportedly were futile. Elvis Presley, the American rock and roll singer who shot to fame in the 1950s, has died at the age of 42. In the shadows of Memphis, Tennessee, Elvis Presley's unique brand of rock and roll took the world by storm in the 50s. I'd like to say that uh, I learned very early in life that without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. But without a song, the world would never bend. Without a song. So I'll keep singing the song. When I was a child, ladies and gentlemen, I was a dreamer. I read comic books and I was the hero of the comic book. I saw movies and I was a hero in the movie. So every dream that I ever dreamed has come true a hundred times. These them over here, you see these type of people who care, who are dedicated, you realize that it's not possible that they might be building the kingdom. It's not too far fetched from reality. Elvis and the friends he made along his journey became known as the Memphis Mafia, and they were like a family. My name is Jerry Schilling. Uh, I met Elvis in 1954 at the age of 12 years old. Ironically, the first day I went to work for him, in 64, he had taken too much sleep medication. And when I got, when I was first getting to Graceland, Vernon was walking down the, the steps with Elvis with a breathing thing on. He was having a hard time breathing, and when he saw me, he kind of snapped out of it and brilliantly said, we're in Memphis, he goes, and he took the breathing thing off because he didn't want me to see him in a compromising situation. He said, kind of winked at me and said, boy, this California air will get to you. <laughs> and, that, and, and it was never mentioned again. I was there seeing concerts in 55 and 56 and 57. The most exciting, raw, animalistic th things I've ever seen. And of course, that will always be my lifelong image of Elvis Presley. Music was the mainstream of his life. Nobody commanded the stage any better than Elvis Presley. It was a fast pace world around him and I really I, I don't think we had the time I think more now we have to pinch ourselves and, and realize what it was like, moving like a freight yeah, yeah he was like really in the eye of the storm yeah. though yeah. very nice talking to you sir we're gonna have to run here. all right thank you very much all right Gene Elvis Presley is leaves in his official car with motorcycle escort and headed now for his hotel all these youngsters and people that come down to see him and no one even knew where his car was going to be but in because the place was so big we had to drive around where he could wave to everybody before going on the stage. When Elvis opened up the curtain and saw that crowd, he got weak in the knees, almost got sick. I swear to God, I had this premonition of another life. You know, and Elvis was standing up at the back of this Jeep. It was kind of like a chariot. And we were like in this Roman Colosseum, and people were reaching over this like seven-foot wall trying to touch Elvis. And it was pretty awesome. I think, oh my God, I forgot who this guy is. 
My first impression when I met Elvis in 1958 was it was hard to believe that this was such a superstar. He was such a natural, good person. Timid, caring, warm guy. Just, when you talk to him, he just talked to you. Like my cousin Red talked to me or some of the other guys. He just was, he, I don't know, there was something about him that just drew you in. And you became his friend. You lived like him. He was no class system. If push comes to shove, he went for us, okay? But as he always once told me, you know, if you're successful, you make him do things a little bit better. Nice your house, maybe an airplane or something. But it all boils down to friends, family, some things to look forward to, and some people to share. Elvis was not only the king, he was the boss. <laughs> Elvis had a tremendous draw to him emotionally and physically, where you looked at him and you thought, that is probably about the best looking man I've ever seen, you know? It was a quick bonding with all of us. Uh, sure, there were, there were some times within the group, there were little arguments or what have you, but it lasted as one of our sayings always was for a day and a half, and then it was over. Elvis's almost supernatural charisma and charm meant he could do anything he wanted. I met Elvis April the 30th, 1964. I was a hairstylist for men. My clientele was some of the, the biggest stars in Hollywood. The Elvis phenomenon has never ceased. He just had a charisma about it. He had a way of pulling in. It, it, people call it Southern charm. He had it in spades. He had it in spades. There really wasn't much that Elvis couldn't get if he really went after it, whether it was from Southern charm or just a strong conviction of saying, I'm going to do that, and that's it. And that's what we always admired about him, that those things slipped away in the latter years. He didn't have the strong convictions. He didn't have, I'm going to get it done. Though Elvis never did care for the business side of his art, leaving most of his finances for his father to deal with. All the business um, uh, guarantees that were given Elvis were all broken, okay, which eventually broke Elvis. He didn't want to know anything about business. He so left he all of his business, personal yeah. finances up to his father. Yeah. I'm not saying nothing against Mr. Presley. He just, he couldn't handle it. I said to Elvis one day, Elvis, you know there's a way that you can have your money work for you. So he you don't understand. have to do all this stuff. Understand. He said, well, go tell Daddy. Well, I go out in the office and, I, like and I tell Mr. Presley, yeah. I said, Elvis wanted me to say something to you about, uh, you know, possibly letting his money work for him. And he said, mind your own damn business. The controversial figure in Elvis's life was Colonel Parker, his manager. If I'd like to live up to my reputation of being a nice guy, this is it, folks. Thank you first uh, meet Colonel Parker. Well, uh... When I was with Bob Neal, Bob Neal was my manager. The Colonel, the Colonel used to take shows out on the road. He'd hire me for an extra at his And uh, he undoubtedly liked the performance that we did. So he uh, decided to uh, uh, start working together to handle the manager. Did you pick from Parker or did Parker come for you? Are we more or less picked together? Trying to bring these contracts. There'll be a stack of contracts this time. Huh? And Elvis was him, I said, what the hell are you doing? He said, well, Colonel's already looked him over. I said, good as a He never looked him over. He said, where I sign and walk away. And I'm going, man, you know how to do that. He said, don't tell me about this. Or you don't know anything about it. I said, well, okay. All this stuff would swirl around him. And he didn't want to do it. By the late 50s, Elvis knew he wanted to move into acting. Moving to Hollywood and starring in a handful of blockbuster movies, but little did the Memphis Mafia know, this would be when the addictions would start to take hold. 
Get up. Get up, little baby. Leave her alone. Get up. Leave her alone. Come on. Get up. Oh, boy. You're a pretty fancy performer, ain't you, kid? Now you know what I do for an encore. Come on, get out of here. In the, in the movie years, the drugs were in control. The sleeping pills and the, the uppers. And he said, I want to be sure, you know, we stay up all night. We, we drive all night. I know you're not used to it, and I want you to, you know, keep up as far as your attitude is concerned. So he said, I want to show you something. So out of his pocket came a little blue velvet case, a jewelry box. He said, open it up. <laughs> well, I opened it up, and it was just chock full of pills of every color you can think of. And I said, good God, what is this? And he said, here, let me give you a few, and this will help you stay awake and, and be in a good mood. I said, OK. So he picked out about four of them, and he said, here, don't take them all at once. Just take them every couple of hours. I stayed up for three days. And to be quite honest with you, you know, it gives you one hell of a good feeling. So I kept taking them. I took them for 15 years. When you start taking the uppers, which is what they were, in order to go to sleep, you need to start taking sleeping pills. So it gets to be a vicious circle. And where today one will work, tomorrow you need two, and the next day you need three, and then the next day you need four. And after 15 years, it gets pretty vicious. I couldn't take them every day. Not to be the goody-goody, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't take that pill because it was going to do to me. Make my mouth dry, it was just going to make me wired all day. And I just didn't want to do it. But I had to take them sometimes because he would stay up at 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.30, 3 o'clock, and we'd get up at 5 to go on location. And there's no way, and you don't. He, <laughs> I learned from the very start, I sleep when he sleeps. Soon, the extent of how far Elvis would go to get his drugs began to show. At one time, in 1966, when Elvis had the ranch, at the ranch one day, Elvis says, I need you to fly to Vegas, because Dr. Shapiro also had an office in Vegas. He said, I need you to get me some stuff from Shapiro and fly to Vegas. I said, OK. So I, I flew out there. He gave me like four prescriptions. I went to four different drugstores and uh, flew right back home the same day. I get home. I give the stuff to Elvis. And Elvis looks at me and he says, I forgot something. You need to go back out to it. And I looked at him and I said, today? He said, yeah. So I had to call Shapiro again and tell him I'm coming back out. I flew back again that next day. So I give it to Elvis, and I looked at him, and I said, don't call me again. I'm not going back out. I had to go out the third time. This time, Sonny was in California. He could get some prescriptions filled, because I couldn't keep going back to the same drugstore. And so Sonny met me. We got the prescriptions from Shapiro. Sonny took some drugstores, I took some. Sonny and I flew to L.A. I flew from L.A. back home. I gave him the Elvis, and I said, I'm damn serious this time. I'm not going back again. In 1969, Elvis began his near eight-year residency in Las Vegas where his behavior began to reach even further extremes of paranoia and anger. Well, you know, his behavior really changed a bit as the 70s went on. <clears throat> Primarily, I think, you know, out of boredom, uh, and he needed a change, and the more pills he took, you know, it's just a fact of life. The more pills he took, that didn't help. Plus the, the threats, you know, on his that life. Didn't yeah. help. That didn't help. That didn't happen at all, you know, so. I mean, it was a combination. You know, the of life things. that he lived. It, you know, it's, uh, paranoia is like you know, you, it's it's unexplainable at times. And he really, you know, 
he just got terribly insecure. In 1969, when Charles Manson killed Sharon Tate and all those people up scared there, him to death. remember? Scared him to death. He armed every one of us. That's when it became very paranoid. And then we get the death threat in Las Vegas, and he has this picture of Manson in that courtroom, and he's picturing someone like that sitting in a courtroom that their claim to fame was they had shot and killed Elvis Presley. And he took Jerry and Red and myself, who were doing the security mainly at that time, and said, tearfully, if it happens, I want you to get to him first. I don't deserve to be caught, shot, killed by anybody. And then he told him, told us what he wanted us to do to him. Listen, he said, I'll tell you what, I don't want no measly mouth, slant-eyed son of a bitch. If he ever shoots, if somebody ever shoots me, I don't want him to be able to sit in a witness box saying, I killed Elvis Presley. He said, I want you guys to get to him first and pull his fucking eyeballs out. And I mean, he just, and, and that really, you know, took us aback. Most of the time when we toured, I was with Colonel Parker, the advanced team. I went in with him and set up the security for the hotels. We set up that security so good, the paper said that Secret Service could take security lessons from Elvis Presley's security because they said we knew he was going to be here, we never could find him. When the death threats first start happening, they just kind of snowball. We try to keep them quiet yeah. because we don't want the copycats, okay? So we kept these things quiet. and. It worked, we had bomb threats. Most people will say, we had a bomb threat at the show and all of a sudden the papers and people, we kept it quiet because we didn't want to have a bomb threat at every venue we played because we had one at the last one. So someone's gonna call in another one at the next one. So we kept a lot of this quiet, just as we kept a lot of things about us and Elvis quiet over the years. Nobody could get things from us, remember? We were a conspiracy of silence and we, we kept it that way, that's the way. I mean, nobody broke, nobody really pierced our veil. It just didn't happen. I'd like to say something right here. Those of you who saw the morning paper, or the evening paper, whatever it was, they gave, they gave me a fantastic, they gave us a fantastic write-up. Now they did, except they said I had a punch here, and I want to tell you something. I got to a damn punch. I wore a bulletproof vest on stage. True. You know, in case some fool decides to take a 22 and blow my belly button off. From uh, 67 through 71, he was dynamite. 72, he yeah, started falling he started apart. Ball, yeah. And the greatest pictures that were taken of him was in those years, where he looked so phenomenal. 165. He was so. He was just. He was absolutely scary looking. He was so handsome. He was just deadly. His spirits were up he at that time too. Looking. He was very high. And he spirit. was happy about being in Vegas. That was a thrill. But he was stuck with it because Colonel had locked the deal. He didn't like the idea of doing, you know, two shows a night, sometimes three, seven days a week, and it bothered him. And it festered and festered and festered until the very end, he hated it so bad he wouldn't do it. He was... There's so many places that I haven't been yet. I, I've, I've never played New York here, you know. I've never been to Britain either, you know. I, I'd like it to, yes, sir. I'd like to very much. I'd like to go to Europe. Had he known he was going to Europe, he would have gone on the strictest regiment that anybody could. Yeah. And I promise you, when we got off that plane in London, he'd have scared people to death. He looks at that. Sure, like he would. Satellite show. Remember how but he got in shape? Was That's that. right. I mean, well, then he had a charge he... to do something. The great thing that kept Elvis going was from one thing to the other. What happened to him is Colonel let him die of apathy. And I blame Tom Parker as more as I blame anybody in this world for putting him the way he did because Tom Parker was an illegal alien and would not go out of the country. Well, the and as a consequence, we stuck our ass over here forever. Had he toured the world outside of the United States, he has still been fucking the morning. Morning. The the morning was Amen. Over. The morning Amen. Was Among his large debts, Colonel Parker also had a massive problem with gambling. Colonel Parker probably was one of the most degenerate gamblers I've ever known in my life. 
In Nevada, they used to say his money's not worth anything. He played roulette and, and would, put, would put chips on every number. He would play craps and bet the horn, the center. The great uh, precipitation of, par of problems with Elvis and the Colonel was over his gambling. And Elvis believed at the end, toward the end, that the reason he was playing the hotels was trying to pay off the Colonel's debts. One night, I walked down to the casino. I just left Elvis. And I noticed there was a large group of people, and they were all in front of a table watching someone gamble. And as I walked up, it was Colonel Parker. And he was playing the sucker's game of all games. It was called the Wheel of Fortune. The odds of winning that game are the worst. He's at the table, and he spots me in the crowd. Larry, he said, come on, come here, come here. Sit next to me. Give me some good thoughts, Larry. I said, OK, Colonel, and I felt so uncomfortable. I really did. After about five, 10 minutes, I said, Colonel, uh, maybe you'll do better now. I hope you will, but I have to get back upstairs. So I left. The Colonel was there for hours upon hours upon hours until like 5 o'clock in the morning, and he lost one and a half million dollars that night. When Elvis found out about it, 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 it he couldn't believe it. He said, a million and a half dollars. That's obscene. Most people don't earn that kind of money working their whole life. And he goes and squanders money like that. He said, oh, yeah, he can do it because he's got me. I'm his ransom. What's going to happen is he's going to have to turn around, make a damn deal with me coming back to Vegas, which I, I don't like Vegas. This is Sin City, man. I don't like it here. I'm never going to come back here again. <laughs> Ironically, he never did. Now, at the end of Elvis's life, there's no question about it. He was on the verge and made plans to fire Colonel Parker, to cut down his entourage to four to five people. He wanted an entire new career, a new life, a new lifestyle. By the mid-70s, as the situation became more desperate, it was becoming clear that Elvis was at the end of his rope. No matter how hard his friends tried to intervene, his years of addiction, paranoia, and stress had broken down his body. I think the main thing about the, the situation with all the drug stuff that he was taking is the way it affected us. We, everybody knows how it affected him. But it just totally terrorized us. So what we did is we really sort of majored everything we had and knew at the time to prevent it. And we did the best we could. And then he would fire you and you couldn't do any good. But if you hung in there, you could possibly keep him alive another day. Everyone it, knew that if they can't be around him, he's going to fire everybody. Yeah, and then, and you then couldn't you, do anything. And then, you, then you can't help. We had had a group effort a couple of times, actually to address Elvis. It's, it's hard to, um, to psychoanalyze everybody. Everybody's relationship was with Elvis. Our secondary relationship was with the other people. I think Elvis has given up on some of his dreams at this particular point. I think he's getting tired. I think he's getting bored. I think there are new people coming around that probably think that's the norm. But for us that really knew Elvis most of his life, this was not the norm for him. I would go into like just really feeling horribly sad, but I was just mad. I stayed mad. I just could not believe that he did that to himself. I just could not believe it. I mean, Elvis, he took the same load on an empty stomach that he took when he was eating. So it, it went to his system faster. And, you know, he was losing a little of his patience. There's no way of getting around the fact that the drugs were affecting him, not just physically. Uh, it's hard for me to admit to that, but I think we do more injustice by 
not admitting it. The worst thing that Elvis did, and he got me upset, got Sonny upset, is that he would use our names on prescriptions. I had a situation, I must tell you, that one time a Demerol, a liquid Demerol, came to the house in, on Monteville Drive in my son's name. And my son was like four or five months old by a doctor, a dentist in California that had written for Elvis. I intercepted it to see what it was, and I had no idea that my son's name was on there. I want to see what it was and see if there's something I could do to change some of the strength of it or whatever. And there it was on this liquid Demerol bottle, Brian West. I went to Schwab's, took the bottle. I said, I want this taken off right now. I want it removed from your records, and so help me. I don't care who calls it in. If you ever send another drug up to that house in my, my wife, or my son's name, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in serious trouble. Yeah, well, he did that so it wasn't in his name. So that if they ever checked, whoever keeps tabs on these things wouldn't see all these in his name. An investigative reporter for 2020 found that he had written 10,000 tablets or medication, not individual, I'm talking about the total amount of pills and everything, 10,000, in one year's time. And of course, he said, well, some of the guys shared in those. <laughs> Elvis didn't share his drugs with you, man. I mean, he might give you a Percodan if you hurt yourself or something like that, but he's not giving it to you on a basis where you can just go ahead and get high from it every day. Elvis is in the hospital doing quite well. And, um, um, he didn't like the hospital food, so the maids would make food at Graceland, and Aunt Delta would put clean pajamas in, the, in a bag. Aunt Delta said, you know, Elvis is expecting this bag, and I don't know where Sonny is, and I said, well, I'll take it, you know? I'm going up there anyway. And she said, okay. And there was a package on the top of the bag. And I said, and Delta, what's this? And she said, I don't know, it came from the office. I'm supposed to put it in there. We kind of had a philosophy of not just taking unmarked packages to Elvis. We, we had a good security system. Didn't want to open up something dressed to Elvis, but I wasn't going to take it up there unless we did. And opened it up, and it was some type of prescription. I said, you know, I'm going to go see Dr. Nick on the way up. So I went to Nick's office and I said, look, evidently Elvis is expecting this package and here's what's in it. Uh, it looks like some heavyweight painkiller or whatever. He said, I cannot get any help from the other doctors. And he said, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt. He had his nurse have it uh, analyzed, a little clinic there. And I said, Nick, I don't know what to do. I mean, this is probably my job, but uh, I don't care. If that's what it takes, he said, you know, no, take it up there. I said, really? He said, yeah, take it to him. He said, I want to see what he does. <laughs> I go up there, and Vernon's in the room and a couple of guys, and Elvis knew. And I, I started to explain to Elvis why this bag was open, because I haven't even given this package in the bag, haven't even given it to him yet. And he said, guys, will you excuse me? So everybody walked out but me. I said, Elvis, I didn't know where this package was from, so I opened it. And he said, look, I, I didn't want to embarrass my dad, but... Um, He's having some prostate problems, and I got this medication for him. And I said, oh, okay. So I gave him everything, and he put the uh, medication in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. I talked to Nick. I said, Nick, what happened? He said, it's still in the medicine cabinet. He said he hadn't touched it. So after about three days, Dr. Nick walked into the bathroom there and act like he just found this. Elvis, what is this? And he said, oh, 
probably whoever was in here before the last Where the year. alligator grows so me. I loved a girl that I swear to the world made the alligators look me. His temper came out several times at me during the years I worked for him. Some of us talked it over one day about how bad the situation was going with Elvis. And we discussed it with some of the guys that were getting it to him in a way that don't do it anymore, you're going to be hurt. And we're going to turn your doctor friends in to the medical association. Well, it dried up for a while. The guys were scared of us, the ones of us that were going to do something to him physically. Elvis finally said, what is going on? I'm not, I, I'm, how come I'm not getting this or that? And finally, Ricky, his brother, his stepbrother, told him what was going on, that we had threatened them. Elvis called us in on the carpet, he told us we better stay out of his business. It was none of our business. He was in charge. He knew what he was doing. He needed it right now. He was asked, well, what happened to the good old days when you didn't need it? And you, he said, there are no more good old days. So he said, if you don't stop it, you're going to be looking for other jobs. We didn't stop it. Three or four months later, we were fired by his, his order through his father. He was told, we know from Linda Thompson, she was present. Elvis told his dad to give us enough money to live on for two or three months because he was going to hire, hire us back. The amount mentioned was $5,000. He said, I've just got to show him I'm still the boss. Well, instead of his dad doing that, he called us in on the phone. He gave us three days' notice and one week's pay and said goodbye. Oh, I broke down and cried. I was mostly knocked on my ass. I just couldn't believe it, what I had committed for him and for him to do this. I had been fired and talked about being fired over the years, but there was something about this one because of the reason. Every other time, it was like over a girl. <laughs> it really was. correctly in late 74 whatever up College Park Maryland he got out of that limousine I helped him out like I always do at the back of the hotel his hair was unkempt it was always done before it was unkempt he didn't have a hat or mm. one of those hats or anything on it and it, I thought what in the world he said hey sonny very slurred and I thought oh boy we got upstairs I asked the guys what was going on they told me we went up to the security room and we said a circle prayer for Elvis because I, I was so scared of what was happening that episode toward the end of his life was the most terrorizing thing we'd all gone through. It, all the fun that we had had 20 years before was gone and it became joyless. It became moments of great fun followed by continual panic. I could not believe how he deteriorated in the year I was gone. When I saw the CBS special, I was shocked and I was pissed. And I called Colonel Parker one of the few times I ever did on a negative. How could you let him? I called him and I went and met with him. How could you let him be on camera like that? And he said, well, you're a manager, because I managed the Beach Boys at this time. You're a manager. You have to give the artist uh, uh, offers. I said, how could you? He said, I put an offer out there that was ridiculous. And CBS came back with it. And I took it to Elvis, and he wanted to do it. The point is, is that he wasn't in great shape when I left, but he certainly wasn't. When I saw that, yeah, the man looked like he was going to die.
1975, what I had been seeing a little bit of the previous year or so was getting worse. And I was very concerned about his health. And it wasn't like it had been before when he was taking the uppers and the sleeping pills. When he started experimenting with the, you know, the down stuff, that's when we started getting concerned. That was my biggest fear around him. I just could not see Elvis Presley dying. You know, I, I could see oh, I, I him did. stepping out on that stage and not being able to do his show and I'm the fans sorry. booing him. I could see that. They, and I the knew fans what that would do to the him. The fans would not. That would have. You know what happened, that, you know what happened to Elvis? Let me give you a classic example. A fans literally can cause you a lot of problems and they don't mean to. They accepted him the way he was. In any manner. Had they got up and said, get fucked, we don't like the way you look, we're not coming to your shows, and I promise you, in 48 hours or 72 hours, he he'd have afraid. got himself so shaped up it'd have been unbelievable. See, in that's six what months, he'd have been straight. I don't know how you felt, but you know, when we left in 76 and wasn't around anymore, other than talking to some of the guys, I never thought he'd die. Uh, I, I didn't think he was about to die. I don't like to fly. I got on an airplane with Elvis, and I knew there was no way that plane was going down because I just thought that God wouldn't do that. I don't care if I die. I said, flip, pull up, and fly. I don't care if I die. Don't ever leave me. Don't ever say goodbye. I never thought he was going to live. You know, I kept saying, I said, guys, this guy is not going to make it. You know, I used to tell Colonel, and I'd tell, you know, I'd tell Billy, I remember we stood down, I said, that guy ain't gonna make it. I said, you remember? I said, there's no way a person can put himself through what he's putting himself through and make it. In August of 1977, the unresponsive body of Elvis was discovered on his bathroom floor in his Graceland mansion. He was only 42 years old. But the Elvis. I thought he had no right to die. I thought he had no right to die at that age. Uh, I think that he left too much on the table. If anybody ever left too much on the table, Elvis died. I can't believe it. I just can't. I've been a fan of Elvis since I've been 16 years old. He was a gentleman. Very quiet, good sense of humor, very serious about his work, very sensitive, um, a very uh, private. Like I said, it was a double-edged sword. I didn't, I thought he was immortal. I mean, every time something happened, something happened like an angel, you know, his guardian angel pulled him out of it. So I had that feeling, but at the same time, Billy, what I saw in 76, it scared me to death. And he and died I by thought, himself. Yeah. And that's what makes me fucking mad. Yeah. That makes me mad. Uh, he, he died by himself. See, that... And the cause of death is cardiac arrhythmia due to undetermined causes. Now, what this means is that there are several cardiovascular diseases present, which include a history of mild hypertension, which was under pretty good control, and some uh, coronary artery disease. Now, these two diseases uh, may have been responsible for this cardiac arrhythmia. It's almost like predestination. It was like he was... I've always said that Elvis was like a artillery shell. They loaded him up, fired him, and he, he, he uh, uh, fell out of the ark and just the, uh, went into the ground and blew up. Now he looked at himself strictly as a human being. He's, uh, like I said, been very lucky, but his life blood running through my veins and can be snuffed out in just a matter of seconds. Nobody wants to, especially die alone, I don't think. Uh, 
It'd have been so nice if we'd all could have been around. But, uh, I mean, as it was, he fell forward in the floor and died. It was horrendous. I mean, somebody should have got in there to him. And I won't say names, but it shouldn't have happened. I think in any other part of this business, if you look at it, I mean, he was responsible for so much. And yet, when he died, he took so little with him. And I think that uh, uh, that's sad. Uh, he didn't. He didn't have the chance to really enjoy what he could enjoy. Uh, he enjoyed the planes and the trappings and, of money and everything. But I think that really, there comes a time in your life where you really enjoy a lot of things that you couldn't when you were at a certain age. I miss the companionship of him. I miss the fun. I mean, you know, as older you get, you don't think of the bad times as much as you do the good times. And I, uh, I miss that. And you know, what I had with him and what all of us had had with him, uh, nobody has that in a lifetime. He said, okay, Larry, but remember one thing. Angels fly because they take themselves so lightly. We both laughed. So that's the time I ever spoke to Elvis. We're all like brothers, and he was the guy that held us together. Uh, we're family. No matter what we go through, we're all there for each other. And if, if Elvis did not do anything in this world, he forged a friendship uh, and a family that lingers in this bed.